Welcome back. Uh, you're with us here on Editor's Roundtable. Let's talk about China, right? I mean, uh, the big engine of global growth for the last 20 years or so. Now, perhaps, uh, things are starting to falter a little bit there, and I'll explain why. The title is, Can China Avoid Japanification? Now, uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by Japanification. I don't mean the Japan of today, but I mean the Japan uh, of, uh, you know, the last three decades or so. Uh, the reason we're kind of picking up on this is because this week we got the Chinese, uh, in, uh, both uh, CPI numbers and producer price index numbers, and both confirmed that China, the Chinese economy, is now in a bit of a deflationary uh, zone. Actually, it's outright deflation in China, right? And hence, people are once again asking the question. It's not a new question, it's an old question. People are asking the question whether China and the Chinese economy is going down, what we saw in Japan during the 90s, and then, of course, the, uh, you know, the 2000s as well. But let me just explain what happened in Japan. When we say Japanification, what do we really mean? Uh, so quickly, the, in the late in 1980s, Japan saw a gigantic asset bubble, right? Uh, if you remember, there were stories which said that the imperial palace in Japan was worth more than all the land in California. I mean, it's a, it's a true story. The stock market, the Nikkei 225, went up four times between 1985 and 19. 19- 89. In five-year period, the index went up four times. Uh, what was this bubble based on? It was centered on commercial property and equity markets. Commercial property was a really hot thing, uh, as I just explained. It was driven by highly accommodative monetary policy. Uh, it was also, uh, and the corporate sector overborrowed, it overinvested, and overhired as well. But as it always happens, bubbles burst. It's inevitable. So the bubble burst in 1990s. And uh, it basically damaged banks. I mean, they're the ones uh, which get hurt the first. As a result of that, corporates cut back capacity. They cut back hiring. They laid off jobs. And, of course, uh, they cut back on debt as well. As a result of which, consumer spending was hurt uh, extremely badly. And then Japan basically, in the late 90s, all the way into early 2000s, saw moderate deflation. Prices were not rising. Prices were falling. Uh, consumer inflation expectations also dropped quite meaningfully, which is that, you know, households did not expect increase in salaries. They do not, uh, ex- they do not expect increase in prices. They paid for goods and services. Uh, by the way, we are still in that uh, position in Japan where the Bank of Japan, even now, 30 years later, is trying to get inflation back in Japan back above 2% on a consistent basis. Actually, they've got it above 2%. The, uh, sort of, uh, the uh, aim now is to keep it above uh, 2%. Now, what are the similarities, right? Why are we saying China and Japan, Japanification? The similarities are here. Uh, So first is the housing market, which has been the problem uh, area for China, as we all know. Uh, Once in a while, we hear these big Chinese property companies going bust. The correction did not start now. It's been on for a few years, but it's arguably structural. It's not just a cyclical kind of uh, slowdown in the Chinese property market. Japan, of course, saw the biggest crash in the property market there. Corporate debt is the other one, if you can move on. For, uh, you know, for uh, non, uh, the total non-financial credit to GDP uh, w- got to almost 300% of GD- uh, you know, in China by the end of 2022. Back in the 90s, the number was similar for Japan as well. Similar numbers for household debt, uh, house, household debt both for China now and Japan back in uh, 1989, which was the peak. Population is the other one, right? Chinese, uh, the share of population uh, of people above 65 years uh, uh, in China and Japan, you can see the numbers for yourself, China now and Japan back then. External front, and this is imp- important and interesting. Just like what we saw, uh, what we're seeing in China, which is, uh, you know, uh, China enjoying a huge trade surplus with the U.S. and that raising concerns and tensions, Japan had the same problem, and that basically led to, uh, you know, U.S. trying to hit back, striking back in terms of uh, tariffs, in terms of asking for more open access to markets in Japan back then, all of that. It's a repeat we are seeing what we saw back in the 80s, but what we're seeing in China now. Challenge to the U.S., right? Rise of Japan and China now is a challenge to U.S. Uh, as the largest economy in the world. And as I said, the U.S. is fighting back now. It fought back back then as well. And this is the reason why many fear that the single largest uh, sort of incremental contributor to global growth, which is China, perhaps may go into a bit of a funk, may go go into a bit of a prolonged uh, sort of, you know, down phase, which is what we call Japanification. But it's not all similar. It's a big subject, right? I'll just leave you with a little bit on the optimistic side, how China differs in a more positive way as compared to Japan of the 80s and 90s, 
First is, I mean, it's, uh, China's got much lower urbanization, which means, you know, there is a greater uh, sort of uh, room for people to move from rural to urban areas, which means larger potential for productivity increase. It's got a huge domestic market, is a technological leader. EVs, for example, China leads the world. China's capital account is not fully liberalized, right? Which means that there can't be a fire sale of prop uh, distressed properties and other assets in favor of uh, assets uh, abroad. And of course, uh, you know, the political system is very different. China can do things which uh, other countries can't do simply because of the political system it kind of enjoys. But it's a topic which I suspect we will keep coming back to over the next many years as this plays out. Uh, let's just actually, let me put this to Andrew if he has any thoughts on this one. Because if this were to play out the way many people expect, uh, I think uh, it'll have implications for all, uh, for, for many, many things. Andrew, briefly, your comments. So a few things that shows you a great analysis, by the way, because I remember the Japan falling uh, very sharply as well uh, back in those days. But uh, I think a couple of things slightly different here. I think the, the uh, deflation is probably more temporary uh, over, over the next few months. I, I think you'll see that some of that is, is more to do with year over year comparisons. Um, so I think that uh, the inflation will start to pick up. I think secondly, I think the, the, the biggest factor is obviously, you know, whilst you talked about that aging population, let's not forget that there's, you know, 430 odd million uh, people under the age of uh, under the age of 30. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a consumer led market. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, in, industries uh, across the world will still want to go to Japan. There might be just some you know, with, with the US, that kind of geopolitical kind of uh, nervousness, and that's why, you know, India is seen as plus one. Uh, but overall, I, I, I feel that that's, it's, uh, it's, it's a big enough economy uh, to get through this. And uh, I think you'll see that the government will make some of the right steps going forward. So I'm not as negative as uh, uh, the comparisons are good, but I don't think, uh, I think if anyone looks at what happened in Japan, then the, the steps that they need to take will be taken uh, very swiftly. Okay. Well, Andrew, we we'll let you go on that note. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot for joining in. And to all of our viewers, have a great weekend. The news continues right here on CNBC TV 18.